April 1982. Argentine forces have invaded British overseas territory in the Falkland Islands. 8,000 miles away in London, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is furious. She sees the invasion as a direct attack on British sovereign territory. Despite strong political pressure to resolve the situation through diplomacy, Thatcher orders British military forces to retaliate, and within 48 hours a naval task force is sailing south towards the Falklands. Unlike modern military structure, where the armed forces work alongside each other, in 1982 the Army, Navy and Air Force were fiercely independent. Each service was extremely protective over their own roles in the conflict. The Royal Navy would provide the main task force. This would include two aircraft carriers, eight destroyers, 15 frigates, six submarines, 10 tankers, 28 sea harriers, 32 Sea King helicopters and one brigade of Royal Marine commandos. The army would reinforce the task force with two regiments from the regular army, two battalions from the parachute regiment, a battalion of Gurkhas and an unspecified number of SAS troopers. As for the RAF, the only frontline aircraft they were sending were eight Harrier jump jets. It's easy to see why they were feeling a bit left out. In truth, there was much head-scratching at the highest levels of the RAF as they desperately tried to figure out what they could bring to the conflict. Making the situation more urgent was the fact that government were carrying out a defence spending review and the RAF were fighting to defend their budget. They needed to do more than just transport supplies. The problem was that the Air Force didn't have anything obvious to offer. They could send some more Harriers, but the Navy's aircraft carriers were already full of their own planes. The Blackburn Buccaneer didn't carry enough engine oil for operations in the South Atlantic, and the Air Force's latest toy, the Panavia Tornado, had barely been in service for a week. It was far too new and untested to be deployed on operations. But one out-of-the-box thinking officer thought he might just have the solution. The Falkland Islands were over 8,000 miles from the UK, well outside the range of the RAF's operating bases. But there was one place that, although it was so remote most RAF pilots had no idea where it was, offered a solution. A thousand miles off the African coast, Ascension Island is a British overseas territory that has a small but perfectly usable airport. In fact, at the time, Ascension Island's runway was being used as the emergency landing site for the space shuttle. Most importantly though, it was only 3,800 miles from the Falkland Islands, and that brought them within range of air-to-air -air refuelling operations. And for that, the RAF had the perfect aircraft. An absolute Goliath, with its distinct Delta Wing, the Avro Vulcan had been the backbone of the UK's nuclear weapons delivery systems through the height of the Cold War. With the country's nuclear capability now being moved to the Navy's submarine fleet, the Vulcans were due for retirement in just a few months' time. But right now, the Vulcan was the only asset the RAF had that would be capable of bombing the Falklands. The RAF's tanker aircraft was the Handley Page Victor. Trailing a refuelling hose, the Vulcan could dock with the Victor to refuel without having to land. The Victor's real party piece, though, was that it didn't just deliver fuel, it could receive it as well. Since the British government had prohibited attacks on mainland Argentina, the Falkland Islands themselves would be the target, specifically the runway at Port Stanley Airport. But the plan was immensely complicated. Two Vulcans would take off, one as the primary aircraft and one in reserve. Eleven Victors would provide the fuel required to make it to the Falkland Islands. These would be split, with four aircraft in red section and seven in blue. Together, they would attempt the most ambitious air-to-air -air refuelling operation in history. All 13 aircraft would fly to the first refuelling window. Here, Red 3 would refuel the primary Vulcan. Red 1 would refuel Red 2, and Blue 1, 3 and 5 would refuel 2, 4 and 6 respectively. If there were no issues up to this point, the reserve aircraft would then turn back to Ascension Island. When the fueling is complete, Red 1 and Blue 1, 3 and 5 would turn back and follow the reserve aircraft back to Ascension. Red 3 would stay with the formation for a while longer before once again refueling the Vulcan and returning to base. Blue 2 will refuel the Vulcan twice more before transferring its remaining fuel to Blue 4 and heading home. Next, Blue 4 will refuel Blue 6 and return to Ascension Island. Over the next few hours, Blue 6 will refuel the Vulcan twice more before topping up Red 2 and turning back, leaving just two aircraft in the formation. Finally, around an hour before reaching the target, 
Red 2 would top up the Vulcan for the last time before turning back and leaving the Vulcan to continue alone. Since it carried no active defences, Approaching the Falklands, the Vulcan would descend to just 300 feet, flying at a speed of 350 miles an hour to maintain the element of surprise. At the last minute, it would then pop up to 10,000 feet, taking it above the range of Argentine ground defences. To maximise the chances of a direct hit, the Vulcan would cross Port Stanley's runway at a 35 degree angle and drop 21 1,000 pound bombs. As soon as the bombs were away, the Vulcan would make a steep left turn back out to sea and climb up to a safe altitude. Meanwhile, a fleet of four more Victors would have launched from Ascension Island to rendezvous with the Vulcan and the long-range Victors to provide the fuel needed to get home. 2300 hours. The formation of two Vulcans and 11 Victors take off from Ascension Island, but immediately there's a problem. The primary Vulcan has a flashing cabin pressure warning light. The captain, squadron leader John Reeve, immediately knows the cause of the problem. Through the small cockpit window by his left shoulder, he can hear the outside air rushing into the aircraft. Desperately, he attempts to plug the leak, firstly with his flying jacket, and then with the cellophane wrappers from the crew's sandwiches. Unfortunately, neither method works. The crew would never survive the exposure to the freezing air that's pouring into the cockpit. Even if they could, the Vulcan didn't carry enough oxygen for the crew to leave their personal oxygen masks on for the duration of the 16-hour mission. Reeve was left with no choice but to abort and return to Ascension. Flight Lieutenant Martin Withers, piloting the reserve Vulcan, can't believe it. Although fully briefed and trained to carry out the role of the primary Vulcan, he'd never actually expected to fly the position for real. Expecting to return to Ascension Island after the first refuelling bracket, He'd even arranged to meet his friend for a beer in just a few hours' time. At the same time, one of the victors has been carrying out a test of their refuelling system and discovers a significant fault. It too turns back to ascension. The mission is rapidly falling apart, and it's not even 30 minutes in. The next refuelling brackets pass by successfully, with victors gradually turning back to base when they complete their refuelling tasks. Unknown to the Vulcan crew though, the returning victors have discovered a serious problem they're running out of fuel. At the time, nobody knew why, but by constantly adjusting thrust to maintain formation, and by overloading the aircraft with fuel, and for the Vulcan, bombs, the aircraft are burning up to one and a half times more fuel than the planners had predicted. Oblivious to these issues, back at the attack formation, Blue 6 is attempting to refuel Red 2 for the final Victor-to-Victor -Victor refuel. The aircraft have flown into an electrical storm and are being thrown around the sky by severe turbulence, making it extremely difficult to connect to the fuel hose. Eventually, though, they make contact and fuel begins to flow between the two victors. Then, a sharp jolt of turbulence forces the aircraft apart, and in the process, Red 2's refuelling probe shears off. Breaking radio silence, the two aircraft decide to swap roles. Red 2 will give its fuel back to Blue 6 and turn back to Ascension Island. Blue 6, flown by squadron leader Bob Tuxford, will then continue with the Vulcan. Tuxford's Victor, however, like the other aircraft, is desperately short of fuel. He calculates that unless they turn back now, they won't have enough fuel to make it back to base. Tuxford explains the situation to his crew, who unanimously agree. They've come this far, so they'll continue. They'll give the Vulcan as much fuel as they can before turning back. They'll then attempt to radio ahead to arrange emergency refuelling on the way home. Failing that, they'll have no choice but to bail out of the aircraft around 600 miles short of ascension, and hope for the best. Just one hour from the Falklands, Tuxford and Withers connect for one final refuel before the attack. Withers is expecting to receive £12,000 of fuel. Having received just £8,000, he's astonished when he receives the signal to disconnect. Radio silence has meant that he has no idea how desperately short of fuel Tuxford's victor is. Despite his anger and confusion, Withers disconnects. He decides to focus on the attack and worry about fuel later. The Vulcan descends to low level to commence the attack run. Crossing the coast, it pops up to 10,000 feet, and the automatic timer releases the bombs. The moment the last bomb leaves the aircraft, Withers stands the aircraft on its wingtip, and pulling hard carries out a 2G turn back out to sea. Withers takes the Vulcan up high so he can save as much fuel as possible. Once safely clear of any possible Argentine fighter aircraft, the crew transmit Superfuse, the codeword for a successful attack. 
Hearing this, Tuxford, in his victor, finally breaks radio silence and contacts Ascension to declare his fuel emergency. A victor is immediately dispatched to refuel him. An RAF Nimrod guides Withers Vulcan towards a waiting victor where the final refuel of the mission takes place. After 16 hours in the air and having flown nearly 8,000 miles, Withers Vulcan is the final aircraft to land safely on the runway at Ascension Island. The effectiveness of the Black Buck raid has always been hotly debated. Just one bomb blew a large crater in the last third of the runway and this was repaired within 24 hours, although not to a high standard and it would cause several near accidents over the next few weeks. Despite the damage, the runway continued to be used by transport aircraft for the duration of the conflict. The RAF maintained that this was always their intention. Their objective had not been to destroy the runway, but to render it unusable to the Argentine jet fighters. In this, they were successful. Concerned about losing their valuable fighter aircraft, the Argentine Air Force held their advanced fighters back on the mainland, handing air supremacy to the Navy's sea harriers. The Navy, though, backed up by a US Marine study, felt that the operation was too costly and used too many resources to justify delivering a single bomb to the runway. One Royal Navy pilot believed that with the same budget, their Sea Harriers could have flown over 700 missions and dropped nearly 2,500 bombs. Regardless of the true effect of the raid, what cannot be questioned is the determination and the bravery of the RAF crews, in particular the crews of Flight Lieutenant Martin Withers and Squadron Leader Bob Tuxford. Make sure you're subscribed for more videos. And if you like the video, leave a thumbs up and let us know what you thought about the Black Buck Raid in the comments.